So I'm guessing you want to talk about this next door situation? I don't know how much I want to talk about it because it's pretty embarrassing that I wasted an entire day um, responding to MAGA chuds on <laughs> next door. Um, I'm not a frequent, like, I'm not a frequent next door poster. I'm a, <laughs> um, I'm an occasion. It's a dangerous game. It is. I, I'm an occasional lurker because, you know, I think that the, the thing about next door is it's definitely the darkest social media app that there is. I like, guess the worst. What's your argument? I'm curious. Well, because the people have real names, right? And you know that they live around you, right? And so like some sort of like freaky MAGA dude online, you're like, oh, I don't know. Like, I don't know who that is, right? Like that's a random, it's just like a voice uh, in the ether, right? But like uh, the the proximity factor is something. <laughs> it, it, that, they are your neighbors. They are your neighbors. <laughs> and so like when you see creeping fascism on the next door timeline, it's like you're not taking a measurement of like, you know, the state of the world or the state of a particular uh, social media app. It's like the state of your neighborhood. Right. And, uh, <laughs> you know, I like to keep my eye yeah. out uh, on, you know, I like to, I, I consider it a form of neighborhood watch. I, I, I consider see something, say something. Yeah. I consider myself basically the head of the neighborhood virtual neighborhood watch. That's me. So uh, in my, my little hamlet of Duluth, which is a very small city, barely qualifies as a city. Um, uh, Ivanka Trump is coming and she is coming to, I don't know, do one of her dumb small business initiative things at this place called Duluth Pack. You may have heard of Duluth Trading Company, which is a, a sort of national. I have heard of that. Yeah, that, yep. that, that's like a national brand. But there's a, a Duluth Pack is they do. They sell similar things. I don't know if they're trying to like coast off the. Uh, did we go into that when I visited Duluth? I think we did. It's got like fancy leather bags and stuff. Yeah, 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 yeah. They have like four hundred dollar canvas knapsacks. It's very overpriced. Yeah. I don't really like it. Um, so I wrote a a nice letter to Duluth Pack and said that I I wouldn't be uh, going into their store anymore or bringing my friends or family like like Joe when they come to visit. I don't even know why I did. I think it's really just sort of quarantine boredom. I was like, okay, I'm I'm gonna post this to next door and just see what the reaction is. Right. Uh because there, you know, as the Goya beans uh issue <laughs> right demonstrated, people get really fired up when their consumer goods get politicized. They get really mad for some reason. Yeah. Um like more yeah. almost more than anything else. And so I uh, I posted. I didn't even mention a boycott. I was just I just posted like the letter that I wrote to customer service, which is like two sentences. And uh, people on next door lost their minds. So it's only been up for like I don't know six hours, and I think it's probably the most commented post I've ever seen on next door. Right? Like that. <laughs> I just got the little weekly digest that it gives for top posts of next door in my neighborhood, mm -hmm. and the top top post most replied to post was like 68 replies or something and you live in a and, in a relatively large uh metro yeah. area right like duluth is very right. small i had over 200 comments and the notifications are still flying <laughs> uh, people were very mad um so you know, like the, the posts, like the, the angry posts weren't all that interesting they sort of like there are like a couple of brands one like cool, I'm going to go buy a Duluth pack today, right? And then there was the other one was just sort of like name calling, like you're so petty. Uh, this is you people or what's wrong with America uh, and that kind of stuff. Uh, so, you know, I'm not going to read through them uh, all day long. Uh, I will say that as it got, as it went on, there was an escalating more liberally applied racism uh, as it went on. Like people started to feel freer and freer to let their racist flag fly. And and they were getting really mad and they were getting really worked up. So eventually, and I, and I had to delete this, uh, it, it was up for an hour or two, but uh, uh, I eventually, after, after like, you know, people freaking out all day, I wrote uh, update, 
I got everyone on my street to give me their Duluth pack bags. And at midnight, I'm going to burn them at the top of Anger Tower, which is like a tourist tower we have in our town. Uh, hope no one tries to stop me by showing up there once again, midnight at Anger Tower. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> you know, I was just hoping uh, someone would be stupid enough to uh, to go there at midnight and be like, where are they? <laughs> um, but, uh, that, that post, uh, actually scared my wife and she, she made me delete it because she, she was afraid someone was going to get mad and come shoot us because a lot of the people, and one of the most popular genres of, uh, of reply was, uh, to tell me about how many guns they had. And, uh, a lot of, a lot of these folks had, uh, a lot of guns. Um, I mean, or they're just, I mean, lying in the same way you were lying about having a Duluth pack bag. <laughs> that's true. That's true. <laughs> I'm sure they have guns, but that guy, he, he boasted about having a grenade launcher. Yeah. He doesn't have a grenade launcher. He said, uh, let's, uh, I got it right here. Uh, you liberals just can't help yourselves. Trump is the best president in my lifetime. I plan on buying more products from Duluth pack to store my assault rifles, tear gas, hand grenades, and rocket launchers. <laughs> Dude, this is just why you don't do this shit. I don't know why I have to be telling you this, but don't stop. It's the first time. I think that was my third post on Nextdoor. Uh, <laughs> you went from like zero to a thousand very quickly. Well, <laughs> I meant it to be a nice post. I mean, I meant it to be like, hey, this is happening in our town and, and we should send a message to these people that we don't want it happening in our town if we don't. I just mean in terms of like, like visibility on the site you went from zero to like now everyone in duluth is talking about this chad volrath yeah dude. well what's really weird is that like uh friends in town have contacted me to say that they saw my post on next door and uh and that and some are writing letters uh shout out to burke who wrote a letter uh to duluth pack uh in support of uh of, of this point um so yeah it's very um very funny uh and and actually it's not very funny it was it really stupid and, and scary and, a, and weird a way to waste an entire day based on what you've just described to me today and my own just like growing disdain for the platform i deleted it i deleted the app from my phone it's just <laughs> a bad place to spend time uh it is it's trash but how are you going to know who the fascists in your neighborhood are right like uh don't you want to I still get the email digest? <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to Zero Sum Empire, the podcast that's taking a critical census of the roughly 640 mostly anonymous American billionaires. Hello, everyone. Welcome back. I'm Chad. And I am Joe. Uh, and this is episode 25. 25. Yeah. So if you've been with us from the beginning, you've wasted over a full day of your life. Oh. Uh, wow. Well, How many days do you show. think we've wasted? <laughs> I feel like 25 episodes, we've got to be getting close to the 10,000 hour mark. It, it seems like it takes... A very long it definitely time. takes us longer than an hour to produce each episode. That I can assure you. So I don't know that there's anything special that's going to be going on this episode. We've got some interesting things that we're going to talk about. Next episode, we will be featuring our first guest on the show. Oh, yeah, that's right. So you can look forward to that. We're going to have a guest join us uh, for the In the News segment. And we're not really sure exciting. what that means. We'll figure it out between now and then. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But as we do every episode, we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about billionaires in the news. Billionaires in the news. Uh, all right. Uh, what is in the news this week? There's a few things. Uh, I guess we'll start with Elon Musk's tweets, which is something. That do we, we have to talk about Elon Musk's tweets? Can we just we assume don't. that Maybe people... this should be the last time because I feel like this is maybe the third time that it's happening. He's so annoying. It's just like, you know, sometimes you, you can't skip it. Like when he was talking about, uh, when he was calling people pedos and saying that he was going to rescue the Thai cave boys, like it was too <laughs> funny to not talk about. Right. This is maybe less funny. I mean, it, it's very funny in, in the sense that like 
it it illustrates uh well let's just cover it real quick yeah let's so, just explain well, it if you're not on two there's two stories let's let's start with the the short one first uh he tweeted pronouns suck which uh, people interpreted as a kind of anti-trans comment which i think it must be i don't know how do you like it that's i mean is said. there an is there another likely plausible interpretation i don't know i mean I maybe know. he's a real grammar head <laughs> What? <laughs> I mean, I mean you know. to me, that's just a kind of awful thing to say. Yeah. Like in this climate, like regardless of what he might have been possibly saying, you just, I guess you so. just got to know there how it's going to be. There is a charitable reading, right? Which is that in English, uh, you know, like you could make the argument that pronouns suck because they kind of condition people into... Uh, a binary uh, view of gender, right? Okay, like, but it, why would you say that on Twitter right now <laughs> yeah, with no explanation? <laughs> yeah, that, I think that's why people are not giving him the charitable reading uh, <laughs> because there's no explanation. There's no nuance to it, right? Yeah. And then uh, uh, his girlfriend, uh, Grimes. Grimes, yeah. What Grimes. Is, <laughs> what, yeah, I don't know anything about Grimes. I don't either. I guess we should have researched Grimes before this. Anyway... She's having his baby and she wrote, I love you, but please turn off your phone or give or give me a call. Uh, I cannot support hate. Please stop this. I know this isn't your heart. Uh, which I'm not, you know, you know, uh, like Kanye is getting into some similar stuff with Kim. I, I think like if I were a <laughs> mega producer, I would I would pitch the show of just Kanye and Elon like. In a yeah. crib together. It's sort of like Rick and Morty, but uh, yeah. it's Kanye and Elon. Just like, uh, I actually don't know what Rick and Morty's about, but maybe like Pinky and the Brain. They try to take over the world. Um, <laughs> yeah. I mean, honestly, like they are kind of Pinky and the Brain. Like that's <laughs> that would be an excellent show. <laughs> so, I mean, not even Grimes was extending the charitable reading of uh, of Elon's tweet. But anyway, that's, uh, that's the small one. The big one is... Uh, uh, he, he did a, he did a meme. Uh, Elon is very into memes. Uh, he, he believes in the power of the meme and he tweeted, uh, Das Kapital in a nutshell. And it was just a picture of Marx and, uh, it's Marx saying, uh, give me that for free. Which is not, it not only pretty dumb, it's also very unfunny. It's just like, it lands like a ton of bricks. Yeah. I mean, it's very uh, Turning Point USA. It's very like it's that it's something that you would see on like the Turning Point USA or one of these like idiot fake activist groups uh, tweeting out, which they, they do all the time. It's probably where it originated. I'm already bored. I do not care about this. I do not care about anything Elon Musk has to say. Let's move on to the next new news item. OK. The next thing that's been in the news all over the place that's been on the late night shows and people have been cracking jokes about it. Uh, is the is the awful awful saga of uh, Jeffrey Epstein and now Ghislaine Maxwell, who is being charged with what sex trafficking, essentially. I don't know what the charges are exactly, um, uh, but I, I, that's sort of what we're talking about. I think what we're mainly talking about is uh, the the Lincoln Project ad uh, suggesting that. She that Ghislaine Maxwell uh, has uh, what uh, resistance people would call compromise on uh, Donald Trump. <laughs> and uh, right. That's, it's basically well, I mean, the next P tape. right? What, like, we're, what we're really talking about is the moment in the press conference where Donald Trump says, I wish her well. Right. And right. everybody's <laughs> like, well, why do you wish her well? Why would you choose Donald Trump? Why would you choose to to have those feelings? A, B, to voice them publicly to the world a hundred days before the election. Again, I mean, <laughs> I just want to like, I want to throw out the charitable reading, uh, which is he's just a very dumb person. And when he doesn't know what to say, he says shit like that. Do you remember like when, uh, I, I, oh, what was the thing? Like, uh, somebody, someone died or, uh, oh, was it? A, oh yeah. He, uh, he tweeted about a mass shooting, uh, and ended it with warmest regards or something <laughs> like, like he doesn't know 
how to say the 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 right thing very often. I mean, as we know about him, and so like, he always does that, right? He's always like, I don't know what to say. So, uh, warmest regards. Why are you offering these bullshit readings for these awful people today? This is like <laughs> I don't know. a weird, Maybe I'm a a weird mode, mode that you're in. I don't in. know. I, yeah, I, I guess. Uh, <laughs> That's yeah. obviously not what happened. What everybody <laughs> thinks happened <laughs> is, A, like he spent all this time with her. He spent all this time with Epstein. He has some kind of relationship with these people to be determined. But what people are speculating is that she might have something on him. And this is a coded message that is basically designed to make her her think he's got her back or he might just i mean i think the more likely scenario is that he just suspects she might have something on like he's like i don't fucking know uh, <laughs> so I, you know, I, guess, I just want to send the message that you know you scratch my back i scratch yours uh kind of thing so the, so the lincoln project i mean george conway is maybe the most interesting person alive right now uh, i would hard disagree <laughs> on that statement <laughs> I, I find <laughs> just I kidding. barely know who he is, but I don't think he's interesting. Well, like, yeah, who are the Lincoln Project people? Because they why the do you not life. think he's he's totally interesting? Like, obviously not the most interesting person alive, but like married to Kellyanne Conway and doing all this shit. I don't. That's I mean, fucking like, uh, weird. Mary Matlin or whatever her name is, is is married to uh, James Carville. Like, there's a but whole that's bunch the only of, like, other that's the other not true. example. Of I this. think a lot of them do it. Uh, I, I think it's because none of these things actually matter to them. It's just a sort of rhetorical game that they're playing uh, uh, because they are taken care of. Uh, they are secure cool. and uh, they have, you know, health care and jobs. I mean, on the one hand, that's true. But on the other hand, like Kellyanne Conway is out there doing her job gregariously and George Conway is actually pissed about it. Who knows? I think they're just both uh, Chase and Clout. I think they're just trying to get noticed. Anyway, we don't have to agree on that. Uh, yeah, no, we don't. Let's talk about the Lincoln Project, because I find this whole development uh, very disturbing. So, like, they're never Trump Republicans, right? Like, like that's what George Conway is, if I'm not mistaken, Correct. right? Like, yeah. Um, like, Him and Bill Crystal. I mean, right. he's Bill, Bill Crystal Crystal's is very, very well known. David Frum, right? Like these are the big names uh, in the, the Never Trump sort of like guys who were neoconservatives in the 90s and 2000s. And then um, when Trump came along, they're like, this isn't what I meant by being a Republican. And, and uh, now they're all upset to me. Like it, it's it's very disturbing because. It's like it, there was never really any difference between the Democratic Party and the Republican Party to begin with, right? Like there, there are differences around certain social issues and things like that. But basically, it's like banks are good. Uh, we love the police. We love the troops. Foreign wars are good, uh, especially if they result in us gaining influence and resources. Uh, like they all, they have a lot in common, right? More in common with one another, Republicans and Democrats who trend toward the center than say, uh, progressives or, you know, uh, MAGA people have in common with those Democrats and Republicans. And, and so like that, that's sort of always been the case, but now it seems like they're explicitly joining forces to create this new centrist party, uh, that, uh, is trying to claim the massive middle of American voters and ed edge out all progressives and, and, uh, and, and MAGA heads. So Bill Crystal, you mentioned Bill Crystal. I, I like, I noticed the other day that Bill Crystal tweeted, uh, some guy was like, uh, Bill, you, uh, you know, uh, do you agree with these policies, uh, that are, you know, social democratic policies? And, and he's like, I do mostly agree with that. I'm okay with social Democrats considerably more dubious about woke progressives, but a longer conversation, right? Like he's, he's making Twitter overtures, right? <laughs> to, to, uh, maybe we could have a longer conversation about what we have in common and what we don't have in common. And don't you hate cancel culture? And don't you hate like, uh, woke people? And don't you also hate, uh, the MAGA people? And, and you know what, we can really get along with one another, um, you know, George Conway and Joe Biden or whatever. And, and so like, it seems to me that there's a really explicit, like that the the Lincoln Project, their their ostensible goal, their stated goal is to get rid of Trump, right? But the real goal 
is to exclude what they see as extremists. Uh, well, they have no other choice at this point because their whole platform has been hijacked. I mean, but but like, but Crystal. Uh, okay, so here's another. Also from yesterday, Crystal wrote the Republican Party, one thousand dollar business dinner at Trump Golf Club, fully deductible, one thousand dollars in unemployment benefits per month, too generous. Right, so like, <laughs> okay, why is Bill Crystal like, uh, you know, in favor of uh, uh, social welfare programs uh, all of a sudden? Like it, it all, it it seems like. They're sending signals that they're willing to make concessions on certain economic policies. It's a weird time. You know? It is a very weird time. And, and I don't like it. It's making me afraid that what we're going to end up with is like a the last generation of American culture. And we're just going to sort of like like Joe Biden is the the uh, the bomb at the end of Dr. Strangelove. <laughs> and um, American culture is slim pickings, just riding it into an explosion. There is no way out of climate catastrophe with Joe Biden. Did you see this, Joe, that the, the Democratic National uh, Committee uh, voted uh, on what they want to include in the DNC platform and what they want to exclude? Uh, I didn't they, see this. They voted down cannabis legalization and they voted down Medicare for all. Those are not in the DNC platform this year by wide margins um, uh, for legalizing cannabis, 106 no's, 50 yeses for Medicare for all, 125 no's, 36 yeses. You want to know what percentage of registered Democratic voters uh, support both of those policies? 78 percent. Why would the DNC decide that it's not going to include in its platform things that are overwhelmingly supported by the people who uh, uh, supposedly vote for them. Because they don't think that it's going to help them politically as they're trying to move legislation through Congress. Yeah. I, well, OK, I think that, yeah, that's that's one thing. But, but I, I mean, the, the more simple and straightforward answer is that they get a lot of money from large corporate interests, including big pharma for-profit prisons, uh, medical device companies, health insurance lobbyists. All I wanted to say is the Democratic Party is pure trash and things are scary out there. Let's let's move on to the billionaires. So, Chad, you are doing this is a weird episode. This is a historic episode in that we've never covered anyone as famous as your billionaire for today. No, I think that's fair to say. In fact, right? I'm not. I mean, the clo- the closest so far has been like Sumner Redstone. Sumner like, Redstone, I mean, I, who, uh, uh, Philip Anschutz. Uh He's I mean, up there. these aren't even this not even close to not even the close. level. No, but I think those two might be in the top fifty, right? Like uh, uh, we generally don't crack the top the 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 fifty wealthiest people. Like we're usually down in the two and three hundreds. Uh, but today uh, we have uh, I think number four. I probably should have looked that up as part of my research, but uh, it's Mark Zuckerberg. It doesn't matter. You're not here to learn about. Zuckerberg today. You can go anywhere else on the planet and learn about him. That's true. Yeah. That, I mean, that, it presented a difficult task because like, well, everybody knows, you know, you could Wikipedia Mark Zuckerberg and get everything that you need to know in terms of his biography and uh, and that sort of, or you could just watch the social network, which is, I was thinking about the social network, which is like the, <laughs> is the character in that is the opposite of Mark Zuckerberg, right? Like Mark Zuckerberg is the, not a- The Eisenberg character? Yeah. yeah he's not a fast talking, witty, uh, you know, sardonic, <laughs> you know, kind of like <laughs> character. Like he's just, uh, he reminds me like, like physically and and- psychologically and emotionally of Commander Data from Star Trek The Next Generation. You sent me that picture. Yeah, he looks like him. And also he just like is is very boring. I guess Data was actually, you know, he was funny and, and kind of fun to be around. I don't, I don't get the sense that Zuckerberg is. So the, the task was tough because it's like, well, what do I do? And so what I decided to do in the end, and I realized that we can probably do this with anybody who's in the top 10, is to just cover the stuff that happened with them since the last time we recorded. And uh, and so <laughs> like I'm, I'm really 
only going to be talking about what Mark Zuckerberg has been doing during the pandemic, during uh, his quarantine. For the month of July 2020. Yeah, basically. Yeah. Huh. Okay. That's an interesting angle. I mean, it was a tough assignment, so I'm curious to see what you well, come up with. Yeah. I mean, I, I think that, so the, the premise of this show is that like most billionaires are anonymous and there's not a lot of information out there about them. And so that what we do is like research as best we can and, and let you know who they are. Uh, but the opposite is true with anybody in the top 10, probably top 20 wealthiest people uh, list. It, it, it's like there is a constant stream of news about Mark Zuckerberg or Jeff Bezos or whoever. Right. And so right, yeah. you're never going to be at a loss for things to talk about. Uh, but luckily, uh, the thing that gave me this idea is like uh, uh, something happened with Mark Zuckerberg this week that brought me so much joy. Uh, it's it's hard to explain how how much happiness I was brought by this event. Is this um, the surfing? Uh, the Mark Zuckerberg surfing pick. Yeah, it just happened. <laughs> I'm gonna I'm texting it to you right now uh, again. <laughs> uh, oh, I can't do it. Do you have it there in front of you? You just Google Mark Zuckerberg surfing. You'll find it. There he is. Yeah, I've got it. <laughs> What do you, uh, so can you describe, why don't you describe the picture for the audience just in case they haven't seen it? Well, I mean, Mark Zuckerberg is standing on a surfboard, I guess in Hawaii because it's captioned and mm -hmm. I know that. And he's sticking out his thick booty. Uh, <laughs> he definitely is. He's looking thick yeah. for sure. And He's <laughs> he's got he's got more sunscreen on his face than any person I've ever seen wear sunscreen. Yeah. It's it's like it's a, a hyperbolic it's layer like geisha of sunscreen. Makeup, right? Like he's a <laughs> yeah, right? like, um I, a lot of people were comparing him like uh putting his head on like the Joker's body because of the white makeup. Um but you could think geisha uh for me, I mean he's very clearly a mime. He's like, yeah. Oh, it's definitely a mime. Yeah, that's exactly it's right. It's a mime yeah. vibe. He's an aquatic. But like, mime. how does he? How does he put that much on and then <laughs> it's, go outside? Oh, it's that like <laughs> zinc stuff, that zinc cream uh, that people put on as a sunblock. Is his basic philosophy like, I don't care how I look, I'm not taking any chances with this face? Well, is that was well? Yeah, yeah. I don't want to mess up this <laughs> perfect face. Um, <laughs> this perfectly smooth and featureless face. Uh, <laughs> We'll get into that. I, I don't think, I'm not sure. That, we're we're going to get into that? Well, okay. I mean, I, I'm not sure that he expected to be photographed and, and, and maybe had good reason to expect that he wouldn't be photographed. Oh, okay. Um, but, the, you know, the first uh, thing that I want to quibble with, Joe, is that you said it was a surfboard. It's not a surfboard. It's a $12,000 e-foil. Um, the the e foil. I only said it was a surfboard because New York Post said he was surfing. Well, it looks like so, they fucked up too. Um, both of you are wrong. Uh, an e foil is like a surfboard, but it's filled with batteries and electronics, and it has propellers, and you control it with a hand control. Right. Uh, yeah. I mean, obviously, now that you say that, there's no waves. Right. Standing yes. up. On yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, and. Like I was, you know, I was thinking about this a little bit, right? Like the, and the, to me, the e-foil, like Mark Zuckerberg riding an e-foil is the perfect metaphor for how Silicon Valley people think about the world. Like at first, I, you know, it's like automate everything, right? Like uh, how do I enjoy surfing? Well, I have to figure out a way to automate it for myself so I don't actually have to do it. Right? Uh, like there, there's this impulse in Silicon Valley to delegate all human decision making to machines right hmm. so like the responsibility for like balancing yourself and staying afloat and like steering uh and all that you just like automate that you don't have to move your body you just like move some switches on your little hand thing but like surfing was a perfectly fun activity right like you don't need to motorize and automate surfing to make it like more fun right like but it's hard what's hard surfing is hard yeah sir yeah you have to like know how to surf to surf. So this apparently is very easy, but if you speed it up, then it rises out of the water and you're kind of hovering above the water while the propeller is still in the water. Apparently that's very hard. Mark Zuckerberg is not doing that. But um, does Zuckerberg know how to surf? 
I guess that's my question. Is this don't, like don't a workaround? Like he's like, I can't surf, but I have a bunch of money and I can have this cheat device. Or <laughs> it's like a cheat it, code d- for surfing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Maybe. I don't know. But like, but I mean that that to me is an important element of this conversation. Is he capable of actually surfing? That would be really sad if he was if he was not. So it's like it's basically you're putting the bumpers in the bowling lane, right? Like like, oh, I can't do it. So let's let's put a special thing in there for me. <laughs> My suspicion is given all of his resources, he does know how to surf and he's just doing this instead. I yeah, I don't know. That's my suspicion. Yeah. He he was a bow hunter. Like he, <laughs> you, you 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 would do surfing before you went to bow hunt. Would you not? I mean like I, I didn't know. know he was a bow hunter. Um that's Don't a... you know he went on that whole thing where he was like oh, I'm only yeah, going to yeah. eat the meat that I kill. Yeah. Uh, anyway. Anyway, as enough of that. Um, do you want to know what he's doing during COVID? Yeah. Well, he's obviously surfing or riding the e-foil. Uh, he's doing that next to his private island. Did you know he had a private island? I mean, if, well, no. But had you asked me the question, does Mark Zuckerberg own a private island? Guess yes or no. <laughs> I would have guessed yes. Yeah, well, probably not this one. Uh, his private island is called uh, Hawaii. What? Actually, it's just one of the Hawaiian islands, Kauai. Um, but that's what I want to get into now. What do you mean? He doesn't own Kauai. Well, not yet. But he might. <laughs> um, really? Yeah. Uh, what? In 2015, he paid a hundred million dollars for a 700 acre estate in Kauai. And the story that I'm going to explain about, like after he purchased that property is going to remind you of what a lot of billionaires that we've covered on this list do. And you could call it privatization. You could call it primitive accumulation, which I think is a very good term for it. Or you could literally just call it what it is, which is colonization. He is in the most literal and straightforward sense, colonizing Kauai. So I, if you, I, I know that might sound preposterous if you haven't heard about this story before, uh, but let me just read you a lead from a 2017 Guardian article. Uh, quote, a few days after Christmas, Mark Zuckerberg shared a series of photographs of his family at their $100 million, 700 acre property in Kauai. The Facebook CEO and his wife, quote, fell in love with the community and the cloudy green mountains, <laughs> he wrote, and decided to, quote, plant roots and join the community ourselves, end quote. Two days later, Zuckerberg's lawyers filed lawsuits against hundreds of Hawaiians who may own an interest in small parcels of land within the boundaries of Zuckerberg's estate. The no shit. quiet title suits, first, first reported by the Honolulu Star Advertiser, are used to clarify the often complicated history of land ownership in Hawaii and can result in owners being forced to sell their land at auction. In some cases, defendants are even required to pay the legal fees of the plaintiffs, uh, the plaintiff, in this case, the world's fifth richest man. <laughs> oh, my God. Uh, so. This is a really complicated story, uh, but it is extremely interesting. And so I-, I How well is it reported? Are there big very well. articles yeah, about yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. There are, there are. Uh, there's a lot of articles about it. In fact, it's been going on since he bought the property in 2015. There have been some recent developments lately. I'm not really going to get into that, but it is still an ongoing and actively reported situation. Um, so uh, a, a paragraph further down in the article, uh, I'll read that before I move on to the explanation says, uh, before Westerners came to Hawaii, stewardship of the land, or uh, Aena, uh, was a collective responsibility characterized by the familial relationship to the land. Privatization came in 1848 uh, with the Mahele, uh, which began the process of divvying up parcels between the king, the government, and the people. Uh, the Kuleana Act of 1850 was intended to allow Native Hawaiians to claim title lands they were cultivating, but ultimately, less than 1% of Hawaii's land area was granted to indigenous people. Okay. Like, the gist of that is that prior to the mid-19th century, the practice of titling private land to individuals was not something that Hawaiians did. It's not how they related to uh, land or land ownership or anything like that. Uh, after they they it was uh, familiarly uh, passed down because people have been farming on these lands for you know generations. Right after the passages of uh, the Hawaiian Constitution in 1840, 
and two other acts in 1850, Native Hawaiians had to petition. If they were living on the land for generations, they then had to petition to get a title to the land that they had been living on and farming on. They had two, they were given a window of two years to file a petition. And remember, this is mid 19th century agrarian Pacific Islanders, right? Like, and, there, and, and somebody comes in and is like, hey, you have two years to file a petition with the state or you lose your land. Right? Uh, most of them didn't do it uh, for obvious reasons. Uh, and the land went almost entirely to the Hawaiian government, settlers from the continental U.S., or the big five Hawaiian corporations, which were all sugarcane producers. So this event is known as the Great Mahele. And uh, uh, as a, a quote, as a result of the Great Mahele and the Kualena Act, the uh, native Hawaiian farmers were virtually stripped of the lands that they had owned for so long. Uh, without land, many of the Hawaiian people became part of an unpaid labor force used by chiefs and foreigners on large land holdings, working on plantations, or they became homeless. As Hawaiians lost their lands, foreigners took advantage of the Resident Alien Act and began buying and selling land in Hawaii. A land division that once gave Native Hawaiians claim to a third of the land of Hawaii was now responsible for them ending up with virtually nothing. Those are the laws from the mid-19th century that Zuckerberg is using to file lawsuits against people still living on those lands who just haven't been kicked off yet. That's, that's disgusting. Yeah, it's fucking terrible. Uh, there is a petition circulating right now. In fact, people should go sign. Like this is the petition is current. It is current. It is being signed right now. Right. Uh, we'll put a link to it in the show description. But uh, I think I have the title here somewhere of the uh, petition. It's uh, oh, stop Mark Zuckerberg from colonizing Kauai. <laughs> and uh, so, if you Google that, you can find it instantly. But that's almost too perfect. Yeah. Like I can't believe it. That's that's so amazing to me. I mean, he's like, this is mine now and I'm going to sue you and you have to prove it's yours. And if you can't and you don't have any resources and also if you lose, you're going to have to pay my legal fees, then you got to get the fuck out. Right. That's that's what he's doing. It is astonishing to me that this is exactly like the kind of thing that I'm sure a certain kind of. Uh, far right or libertarian person today would be like, well, this is America. This is how it's done. Let's just get it done. Like these are the laws. Yeah. And then like it, but if you went back to the, to the genesis of all of this and looked at what happened to these people's way of life, this is exactly the, the, the kind of thing that all the libertarians are like arming up against, you know, yeah, like this, right, that's their biggest right. nightmare. Yeah. You know, that's absolutely it's like, can right. you imagine? Yeah. I mean, you're yeah, you're 100% correct. It really sucks. You know, Zuckerberg's excuse is, well, a lot of these people don't live on the land anymore. Some of them don't even know that they have a claim. And also, they're going to all be fairly compensated. So what are you even worrying about? I have so much money, I will fairly compensate them. That's not the fucking point, Mark. Right. Like that's that's yeah. not what it's that's not, not what it's about. He's pretty awful. He's pretty awful. Uh, he sucks very bad. Uh, but that's what he's doing. He's riding. He's at his estate in Kauai right now. Uh, that's where he's riding out the, the coronavirus. Why? Because California is too fucked up to be in right now. Right. Like he is not spending his time in California because it's filled with COVID-19. Why is it filled with COVID-19? Joe, why is the United States performing so much worse than other countries. When You're asking me for my assessment? Well, there are a lot of reasons. I know that's a hard question to answer. So not It's not, an easy question, but I feel like it's almost too easy. I mean, like we ignored the problem at the federal level for too long and we didn't do the things that we needed to to stop the spread in a decisive way early on in the process and now left to the states it's all kind of impossible to enforce and the nature of the 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 country is allowing for it to just spread ad infinitum that's right okay so that that's not wrong but let me throw in another non-contradictory but you know like a, a, another factor right like the the countries that are doing very poorly with coronavirus right now are Brazil, 
the United States and Russia, although Russia, it's sort of hard to, to know what the actual numbers are, but they're clearly not doing well. These are the countries whose, what we could call consensus reality, whose, whose social view, uh, a social commitment to consensus reality has been broken down, right? These are the post-truth places, the highly propagandized, far-right sort of authoritarian leaders, you know, like they have certain things in common at the level of the people that have been elected to federal office. There's a correlation, right, between, you know, you, you could blame it on, you know, Putin, Bolsonaro and, and Trump. And, and I think that obviously they're, they are to blame for a lot of things. But when it comes to wearing a mask in public, Trump can only bear so much responsibility for that, right? Like that that people are making their own choices. Masks are not expensive. People are not wearing masks. Why are they making those choices? Because they don't believe it's real. They do not have a commitment to consensus reality, right? Like, But do you think that if Trump had come out in February or March or whenever people started to say that masks were probably a good thing, had come and taken a firm stance? No, I don't. I don't. And the reason and, and I don't think I don't think Trump even had that option because the uh, the conspiratorial narratives uh, that position themselves uh, in allegiance to the far right uh, were already taking shape uh, like the pandemic video. My mom emailed me the pandemic video. I don't know if you've seen that. I haven't watched it, um, but. It's a conspiracy theory that like coronavirus isn't real. And if you wear a mask, it actually gives you coronavirus somehow. Like Total fucking crazy bullshit. My mom like emailed that to me and was like, is this real? And it's not real. And she got it from Facebook. And Jesus. like, and th- this is what I want to talk about for like the end of this segment. Right. Is that I think that Mark Zuckerberg is more responsible for the United States's poor response to coronavirus than Donald Trump. And I think that the re- I think the reason that you can make that argument is because Facebook is where a Donald Trump's crazy lies get amplified and repeated until they become truth. Uh, and also that Facebook as a medium contributes to the erosion of people's commitment to consensus reality. I know we haven't defined that term yet, and I've used it a couple of times. Um, but what I mean is a is a widely held and agreed upon view uh, of the world, right? Like, uh, uh, of is the, is the virus real, right? The consensus, re- the consensus reality answer to that question should be yes. In the countries that were successful in responding to the virus, the answer was near, near universally. Yes. It's the problem. The problem is that we have a very large segment of our population who is not committed to that consensus reality and, um, uh, 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 lives in a kind of information universe where other alternative realities, right. Uh, uh, take precedence. And like, how does that happen? Right. Like that's, a weird sort of psychological process to think about. Why should people believe things on Facebook more than they believe them on television or in the newspapers? Why is that medium more successful at directing people's behavior? Well, maybe it's because it's like more intimate, just like the local news. People trust the local news more than they do the national news. Uh, I think that's part of it, but I think a I think a larger part of it, and this is the point that I'm going to get to eventually, right? Is that, one of the most powerful persuasive elements of an argument is if there is a community of agreement around that argument. Evidence, any sort of evidence, any sort of reasoning always takes a backseat to whether or not there is a community of agreement around something. Take religion. It's the perfect example, right? Like there is no evidence. There's no there's no tangible, concrete evidence that God exists, that any, you know, like, et cetera, et cetera. Everybody knows this, Right. Why does it persist as an idea if there's no evidence? Well, because there's a large community of agreement around it, right? Like other people believe this. So I, I, it must be true, right? Like that's the most powerful persuasive, uh, uh, tactic that, that, uh, you know, or, or persuasive, you know, uh, a factor, uh, that, that figures into whether or not people believe something, right? Well, what Facebook does is it locks you into an information universe where you're only seeing things that are posted by human beings, individuals, news sites, 
or 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 websites or blogs or whatever that agree with your point of view. And you can kind of curate whether things make it into your bubble or don't make it into your bubble. Everybody knows this about filter bubbles, right? Like you, yeah, right, yeah. you filter out anything that you disagree with. Uh, and, and we're all in our own echo chambers. We're all in our own, yeah, yeah. yeah. We're all in our own echo chamber. Right. And so like Facebook is what facilitates this for most people, right? Like most people don't use Twitter. Most people aren't, you know, like there, there just aren't any other real competitor social media. Facebook has like 6 billion accounts, you know, so like most of the world's popular, the majority of the world's population uses Facebook. Right. And when they're using Facebook, they dig themselves into these echo chambers and it it comes to appear that there's a community of agreement around really crazy ideas right like why is there a large contingent of flat earthers right or or, or so so just to jump the gun you're basically arguing that like facebook as a technological milieu accelerates the the process that generates religion you know at some <laughs> that's a, wow yeah i mean i didn't really think of it that way but that's a really nice way to put it right like that that it generates fanatical belief uh to outlandish ideas uh because it gives you the backing of a community of agreement around that idea and what's what's really you know what's interesting to me about it because we're, we're both media studies people right like we come out of the world of media studies and I don't think that it's an exaggeration to say that the founding and and still persistent question of media studies is to try to figure out why there's a gap between the world outside and the picture in our heads, right? As as Walter Walter Lippmann, yeah, as Walter yeah. Lippmann put it in in a hundred years ago. Why is there a gap between the picture of the world that we have in our heads and the way that the world actually is, right? And the answer that media studies gives is because, well, the pictures inside of our heads are always mediated through something, right? Like it comes to us through the newspaper or through the television or, or whatever, you know, whatever. Or through our family or through- Or know. Facebook or, yeah. And so you can talk about it in a different way, a, a bunch of different ways. But like the, the, the way that I wanted to talk about it today, and I want to talk about it mainly because I, I think that it's underappreciated. Uh, and I think it's particularly relevant to Facebook, is this idea that was worked out by a guy named George Gerbner in the 1970s. Uh, he, uh, you know, he's not very well known outside of the world of media studies, but he he taught at Temple and the Annenberg School of Communication at Penn. Um, he was a big deal uh, for a long time in media studies. And his main thing was violence and television. Now, I know what you're going to say. You're thinking, well... All of this has been debunked. Neither television nor heavy metal records uh, nor video games make people behave violently. That's absolutely true. And, and this is not what George Gerbner uh, said. Um, so I thought I'd tell you a little bit about what he said, and then maybe we can talk about how it's relevant to Facebook. Okay. So here's how he, he uh, Gerbner did quantitative research about violence on television. What he would do is give people surveys about their attitudes, he wouldn't mention television at all in the initial interviews. He would, but he would give them surveys about their attitudes toward other people in the world around them. Things like he'd ask them how much they trusted other people, uh, what their views are on authority. He would ask them about their perceived likelihood of being a victim of a violent crime, and he would kind of create like a uh, an index of how fearful people were of the world around them, and then. After they'd completed the survey, he'd have each person keep a diary of the television that they watched for some period of time, a week, a month, something like that. What he found was really interesting. He found that people who watched moderate to high levels of television perceived the world to be more dangerous, riskier, and more intimidating than those who watched less television. Mm. Heavy watchers perceived a greater need for law enforcement. They were less trusting of other people. Uh, and they significantly overestimated their likelihood of being the victim of a crime. So Gerbner found a correlation between the amount of TV watched and how dangerous you thought the world was. And he found this over and over and over again, and he named it the phenomenon, the mean world syndrome. So you had a syndrome where you thought the world was meaner than it was. The basic idea is that a lot like people who watch a lot of TV have a greatly exaggerated view of how dangerous the world is around them or how violent the world is around. Them. 
Like that, that to me is, is the key finding of his research because it shifts the way that we talk about violence on television. Uh, as I said, just like with video games, there is not any evidence that, you know, watching violent stuff makes you behave. Makes you violent, yeah. but it makes you perceive that the world is more Yeah, violent. it makes you think that other people behave violently, right? And that's that's the thing, right? Like that, that's, and think about, think about the Trump era, right? Like it's much, much less, like, p- yes, are people behaving violently because they are Trumpists? Yeah, yeah, to some degree, you know, but it, it is relatively limited. But every single, you know, Trump follower believes that the world is falling apart and Antifa is invading their small Midwestern town. So let's bring it back to Facebook. Just right. So I'm going to bring it back to Facebook. I'm going to I'm going to say I want to say one last thing about cultivation theory here is which is that there's a couple of strange things that come out of it. One it doesn't seem to matter what tv you watched it's not about the shows you watch uh representations of violence are so prevalent as an aspect of television shows that when they did these experiments it didn't really matter if people were watching soap operas or you know uh, simon and simon what's it what, starsky and hutch or what like you know it doesn't didn't matter what people were watching in the 70s it just the world that was depicted by the universe that was depicted by television just contained a lot of violence, right? And and so the picture of the world that it represented was violent. Another thing that's weird, the findings did not hold very well in other countries. So you hmm. you look at a place like the UK that is, that has publicly funded television production. It's not the same as commercial television. And this is something that Gerbner, you know, this was like his life's project was to say that it's not television itself as a technology it's commercial television the structure of commercial television that can i can i ask a question that you you may or may not know the answer to i mean like clearly there you know one of the reasons that there's a lot of violence on television is that violence is a way of creating drama and building tension and this is part of storytelling and many many stories and novels from the beginning of time have relied a lot on violence and plays and Shakespeare and whatever. So is it something that people respond to differently when they can see the, the world through the, no, in the television? That's way? not it exactly. And, and this is, uh, you know, actually uh, we'll post some links to this in the, in the show notes, but uh, this was Ger- I'm, I'm glad you brought up the issue of storytelling because that's what Gerbner's entire career was making one point, which is that when, when storytelling uh, becomes detached from context, uh, and the stories that we tell children about how the world works come primarily uh, from industrially produced programs that only serve to get you to sit there to to watch the commercials, so that to deliver uh, you to the to deliver because you're the product, deliver yeah. you as an audience to yeah to the commercials. Uh, then the content right changes. Like so, yes, is there violence in Shakespeare? Yes. However, it was contextualized in a very different way, right? Like, and also it wasn't Shakespeare was not the dominant form of storytelling that people consumed for seven hours a day on average, children included. Uh, it was a special occasion, right? Like it was a, a thing that, that happened once in a while. And so he, Gerbner's point like over and over and over again is that with mass media, there's an industrialization of storytelling, a mass production of storytelling that detaches it from the local context in which stories formerly circulated. And so religious figures, parents, teachers, you know, all of the people who were involved with you directly in your community used to be the people who gave you stories. And with television, that's no longer the case, right? You're getting stories from Coca-Cola and Disney, right? Like from people who also want who have an ulterior motive. The motive for telling stories used to be to make someone a good person. Now it's to make someone a good consumer, right? And and that's, if you could boil down his life's work to like one point, that was it. And he's like, we really need to be careful about this because it seems like it's fucking up people's brains. And uh, And so, and so basically like you're going to draw a connection between that and, and Zuckerberg and say that Facebook is a platform that's fundamentally doing a similar kind of thing. I think it's doing exactly the same the same kind of thing, right? Like I like this word cultivation, 
right? And, and and people have it's not just about violence. People have done like a really familiar one is like body image, right? Like that that <laughs> the 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 so it, it works much clearer. I, when I when I talk about this with students, it, it, this is much clearer in their minds, right? Why why is there a persistent f- uh, idealized female body image that is consistent across every medium, from magazines to television to film to whatever? Well, it's a it's a special kind of body image. It's not easily achievable, and in fact, for most people, impossible to achieve. But you make people lust after that body image. You make people desire to have that body image. And the only way that they can do it is by buying products. But you also have to make sure that the products don't allow you to actually attain that body image, right? Like, otherwise, right, yeah. you stop buying products, right? And so there's this this very clear, right? With, with female body image, there's this very clear provocation uh, to buy products uh, that plays on people's insecurities and anxieties, right? And and all, all of these cultivation effects work in the same way, whether it's fear of immigrants or fear of violence or or fear of Antifa or whatever. What you're doing is trying to make people feel insecure and anxious so that you can then sell them something, whether it's a political idea or a product or whatever, right? Yeah. That's, that's what Gerbner called a cultivation effect. You're cultivating something inside of someone. Yeah. I think that we could... I think that cultivation theory could probably uh, illuminate a lot of things about uh, uh, social media. And uh, if we kind of like revise it and think about it, maybe in a, in a, in a new way, because it, you know, the, the milieu that, that Gerbner was writing in was like 1970s television when there were like three channels. Right. And everybody right. was watching the same thing. Things are different today, but but effects are still being cultivated and something like the flat earthers are perfect evidence that that is actually happening. People, are, you yeah. know, like, like <laughs> um, yeah. and I think that's what fucking Zuckerberg's legacy is, right? He is without question to me, the greatest contributing force to the erosion of a widespread social commitment to a consensus reality that we have Ever so, so if we have to rank him, does that mean, I mean, is he just a, as bad as it gets? I think so. Okay. Yeah. I mean, the, and the reason why, you know, you know, Joe, I, I skipped over this part because I've been talking for like way too long, but like what I wanted to say, like Zuckerberg is also like the perfect billionaire in the sense that he created an insurmountable social problem and then does the most piddly, stupid bullshit thing to try and address it. So like. Facebook created a COVID misinformation function where if somebody posts something about COVID, a little uh, a little box will pop up and say, "Hey, get the facts here," and and that's it. It's like he created this situation in which hundreds of millions of people are being infected hundreds of thousands of people are dying because they are choosing not to believe that the threat that they're facing is real and what he does in response is to say hey you should have media literacy go do media literacy in your in your brain or something like it, it's so stupid and so useless so yes is mark zuckerberg responsible for 140,000 american deaths not exclusively but he ain't helping, right? Like that he he is he is not making the situation better. He is making the situation appreciably worse. Well, and he created this. The he created the conditions. environment in which it could thrive, right? And uh, and so I I hate Mark Zuckerberg. I think he is extremely bad. I want to give him a nine. I think he's terrible. Well, I want to give him a ten because he's trying to colonize. Hawaii and kick indigenous people off their land, which is a whole nother dimension of monstrousness, aside from the fact that he has destroyed the brains of, of, of Americans as much as Fox News and is likely as responsible as Donald Trump for getting people sick. Like, awful. And I don't care, you know, like, he might be this, like, meek, boring dude, but, like, the the actions that he has taken in his life have led to death and chaos and uh and i think he's very <laughs> bad uh so he's a nine. yeah let's give him a 10 he's a he's a 10 he sucks
All right, Joe, who are you covering this week? So we pulled, uh, the name we pulled off the roulette wheel was Rhonda Duncan Williams. But this happens to be another Rhonda. big family fortune type situation. Okay. So we decided to do the whole Duncan clan all at once. The Duncans. Is How many the, families uh, have you done so far? Uh, we've, done we, we've done the Pritzkers. That was really- I did the Pritz- no, I did the Pritzkers. Well, yeah, yeah. I'm asking how many you've, I think I've done another one too. Mm. Oh, you uh, did like, the uh, McGurko. Mac, oh yeah. Uh, right. Yeah. The 84 lumber family. Um, uh, right. have I done an entire family? Well, I Next did. Family. I did the Cargill people. Uh, oh, you did the Cargill. Yeah. yeah his right. brother, uh, there's a, there's a bunch of Cargills on there and I, I don't know if we decided to cross them all off. I think I crossed off like the brothers or something. Uh, the family, the family episodes are kind of tough, but also kind of yeah. fun or something. I mean, um, as you'll find out quickly, I'm not going to talk a lot about these family members, but I, I'm going to, I'm going to talk a, b- a little bit about them here at the beginning. So the Duncans, according to some sources are the richest family in Texas. Really? I'm not sure if they are. There's a lot of rich families in Texas. They're, they beat the Perot's. I read that somewhere. They're very rich people. <laughs> And all the money comes from the dad, Dan Duncan, co-founder and majority owner of Enterprise Products, which is a natural gas and pipeline company. Uh, I was hoping it was donuts. <laughs> Donut company called Enterprise Products? No, Duncan. I mean, oh, <laughs> right. <laughs> Got it. Okay. So Dan was a self-made billionaire. He came up hard in rural Texas. His mom died when he was young. He fought in the Korean War, made his way into business after the war, and then wound up hitting it big in the oil pipeline business. Uh, so this was in the 60s, I assume? He Yeah, well, I think he, st- he, st- he started, I don't have the exact date here. I think he started Enterprise Products in the early 70s with another guy. Okay. But didn't spend a lot of time on the name of the company. I think he could have done better. Enterprise yeah. products. It, I mean, it's a, yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's a very, I have a name. Very, I don't know what we're going to do yet, but I got a name. I feel like there was a time in the fifties and sixties where you could get away with like just very, very general names. Yeah. International like, business machines. That's like the best name for a company. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, Dan Duncan had a long and successful career and was a relatively well-known figure within the ener- energy industry when he died in 2010. Other than conveying petrochemicals from point to point and also donating a, a lot of a substantial amount of money to hospitals, I think the thing that Dan Duncan will perhaps best be remembered for is a hunting trip he took to Russia <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> in 2002. When he went helicopter hunting and shot and killed a moose and a wild sheep. So uh, the big game trophy hunters out there in our audience may already know that it's illegal to shoot at wild sheep from helicopters under Russian law. <laughs> or it was at the I, time. I did know that. I, so <laughs> I figured you I'm did. I'm very involved in the scene. He had to appear before a grand jury in Houston, but basically claimed ignorance. He didn't realize he was breaking the law. And the grand jury decided against bringing charges against him. So, okay. Right now, there are four billionaire Duncan siblings. Randa Duncan Williams, Milanay France, Deneen Duncan Avara, and Scott Duncan. Okay, I want to go back to uh, the second name that you said. Yeah, Milanay. Milanay I, France. I, th- I think that's how it's pronounced. It's, it's spelled M-I-L-A-N-E. But somewhere I I was led to believe that that is the correct pronunciation. Cool. Yeah. Could be wrong. Anyway, <laughs> who cares? I'm just going to say a little bit about each one of these people. <laughs> when Randa Williams popped, pops up on the good old Google knowledge panel, it lists her profession as, quote, business person. Have we talked about this before? For some reason, I feel like we've talked about this concept before. Uh, the Google knowledge panel? No, uh, just the idea. We definitely have <laughs> talked about that. I'm, yeah. I'm assuming that your fan, listeners yeah. will, will already be up on the Google knowledge panel. No, but the, the, the idea that like 
business person is a profession. Yeah. I mean, does it seem at all weird to you that we refer to business people as business people? Uh, I mean, I yeah, mean for I one, so. business is the most generic occupation ever. But it's also like seems weird that it's acceptable to just tack on a man or woman or person to the end of the word, like as an official term. You know, like we say <laughs> tax man or garbage man. But it's like, it's not, it's, th those aren't like the official titles. Garbage collector, right? Yeah, I, I do garbage yeah, person. No, I... What if you said garbage person? You're a garbage. <laughs> we like calling a plumber a toilet person. <laughs> <laughs> you know, what would you be? I like that. Chad yeah, Volrath, yeah. idea man. <laughs> I have been called a garbage person before. <laughs> yes, yeah. Um, anyway, Rhonda. Is it Randa? I don't even know. Has a law degree and in, in, inherited $3.1 billion when her father died in, in 2010. And as far as the internet's <laughs> concerned, that's pretty much all you need to know about her because there's not very much else out there. Um, and pretty much same deal with Milanae, except Milanae's not a lawyer. She's There's like no obviously a fly below the radar type. Her husband... Matthew France died back in 2014, pretty young. He was 45, but other than some very generic obituaries, I couldn't find any information about him or the circumstances surrounding his death. And there's just not much else out there about Milanay. There's even less information out there about the third sister, Deneen. She's 56 years old wow. and married. And that's all I could find. Uh, um, finally, there's the baby brother, Scott. And he's roughly 37, attended Houston Community College, <laughs> and is now worth $6.2 billion. So um, given that this family earned its fortune in the pipeline business, and given that infrastructure is one of the recurring focal points of this show, you might expect that I would seize on this opportunity to talk about how pipeline infrastructure affects the way we live and the way our society is structured in some way, which would be totally interesting and something that I hope we do someday. But if you thought we would do that today, today you would be wrong. Today, I will be talking about the estate tax. Oh, okay. You mean the, you mean the death tax. Well, we'll talk about that. Yeah, why, why, why will I be doing this? Well, it has, it has to do with a, a fun fact about the Duncan family that I haven't mentioned yet. Again, there's very limited information out, uh, out there about all of these Duncan siblings. But the one piece of information that a quick Google search will reveal about all of them is that they all inherited $3.1 billion from their father, and none of them paid a single penny of a state tax. Uh -huh. And the Duncans are the first American billionaires to avoid paying the estate tax since uh -huh. the estate tax has been on the books in this country. Now, how did they do that? Good question, Chad. Back in 2010, there was a temporary repeal of the estate tax <laughs> for that year. And that just happened to be the year that their dad died. Mm. So let's begin at the beginning and just very generally, for people who aren't familiar with any of this stuff, let's just lay a foundation um, and and just address the, the basic question of mm -hmm. what yeah. is the estate tax? It's a pretty basic idea. Very generally, Chad, can you can you offer a definition, a one or two sentence definition for us? Yeah. Um, if you're super rich and you die, a much larger portion of your estate is funneled back into the public coffers as a way to try to avoid uh, the massive concentration of wealth uh, in the hands of a very few people that leads to an oligarchy. That's exactly right. And there are sort of different versions of it. And there there's a distinction to be made between an estate tax, which is paid out to the government before it, uh, the estate is paid to beneficiaries and an inheritance tax, which is paid by the beneficiaries after they've received the money. But they're very similar and we don't need to parse these distinctions. U ultimately, this is an old idea that dates back at least to the ancient Romans who had had something like this on the books. Here in America, we've had a federal estate tax in place since 1916, although there were 
other precursors to to this law as as early as the the late 18th century. Today, there are various versions levied by different countries around the world, and some countries don't have an estate tax at all. Likewise, certain states have a state-level estate tax, and certain states don't. But as you were saying, Chad, a moment ago, the estate tax by design targets only the very richest families. And the tax is only levied on the value of an estate that exceeds a specific exemption level. Yeah. And this is the place where that no Republican voter seems to be willing to understand. It is that it does not affect you in any way. (laughs) (laughs) Right. Yeah. So hold that thought because we're going to get specific about that. But just to just to explain kind of where we're at with the estate tax right now. In 2017, the exemption level was $5.4 million per person. But this was before the Trump tax law went into effect in 2018 and boosted this exemption level to $10 million. Hmm. Today, the exemption level has actually risen to $11.58 million to account for inflation. Just like our wages, right? And our, our wages and our salaries, those <laughs> yeah. have also gone up to account for inflation, right? right. Yeah, not mine. Hmm. Uh, weird. Crazy. <laughs> so in, in 2025 right now, th- this new estate tax exemption level is set to revert back to the pre-2018 $5 million level. But this could change depending on what bills wind up passing in Congress between now and then. So- Important question. How punishing is the estate tax really to, to those people who have to have to pay it? A very general answer to this question. I'm not going to get into the details of the law here, but in general, on balance, taxable estates wind up paying about one sixth of their value in estate taxes. What? I thought it was way higher. Well, sometimes considerably more, sometimes less. There are lots of workarounds. It's very, very complicated, as you can imagine. But that's approximately a, t- a target figure of, of what, we're, what we're talking about. When we're talking about the estate tax, in general, we're talking about taking one-sixth of the value of multimillionaire estates. Okay, so how many families really pay the estate tax? This is another important question to answer if we're going to talk about the debate. Uh, I would guess not very many. Right? I mean, that there are a million sort of accounting tricks and offshore accounts and all of this stuff that you can just sort of hide your wealth, right, and, and not have to pay it. Yeah, I mean, and a lot of people are doing all of that, uh, for sure. So of the people who die in 2020, it's expected that around 1,900 tax returns will be subject to the estate tax. This is 0.1% of the approximately 2.8 million Americans who will die this year. So we are, we are literally talking about the 0.1%. We're talking about less than 2000 families, uh, that this is affecting, but this is a law that's caused a great deal of controversy and, and debate and people have sort of vehement feelings about it. So I wanted to trace this debate offer a brief overview yeah. of the arguments yeah. for and against i'm i mean I, yeah i'm i'm interested in this cuz like it is very shocking right like that that 0.1% of the population of dead people it's it's got to be like 0.0001% of the actual population that it affects like almost no one is affected by it yet to hear uh republican politicians uh talk about it it seems like everybody who dies, the government takes like 60% of their bank account. Uh, yeah, right? it's like, it's completely absurd. They talk about it a lot, right? Yeah. <laughs> well, it's as we will see, it's part of a very concerted agenda that they have devised over time. So brief overview of the debate. People who want to abolish the estate tax have argued a a bunch of different things. One, it discourages entrepreneurship. That's one of the big, (laughs) big claims. (laughs) People have argued that it's a leading cause in the dissolution of family businesses. 
obviously family businesses that are worth millions of dollars, but be that as it may. They've argued it hurts independent farmers, which has been mostly debunked. And they've argued that it doesn't generate sufficient revenue to to justify its existence. It's like... uh, Wait, what? Yeah, that's a big one. We're not getting enough money from this tax, so let's um let's just not do it anymore. Pretty much, I mean, because they 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 argue that there's like lots of bureaucracies that have to sort of arise to manage it, and that once you're when it's all said and done, it's not worth it. Wow. There's also maybe a more compelling argument that it functions on. It's not that compelling to me, but more compelling than some of these others. That uh, there's also an argument that it functions as a tax on thriftiness. Essentially, so like, in other words, people who save their millions of dollars are going to get hit by the estate tax, while people who spend all of their money on like $10,000 bottles of wine and private jet fuel may get taxed less because there's going to be less money left over. Isn't that good, though, because they're stimulating the economy and that's ostensibly like what the estate tax is trying to avoid is just amassing wealth in a bank account and never using it? I mean, you know, that's a good point. I think, you know, other people would say, but isn't thriftiness also a value that we... No. Okay. (laughs) I mean, not in a capitalist economy. Actually, it's not, right? Like that that money needs to circulate, right? Like it needs the the MCM, right? Like then it needs to to constantly circulate or else it's not doing... I understand that point. Uh, Anyway, it's just an argument that people have made. Um, (laughs) I'm not, I'm not making it. So... Uh, Sounding like Ted Cruz over here. What? <laughs> what? <laughs> That's kidding. the most. Now you're doing charitable readings and and. Uh, uh... No, I'm not. I'm just <laughs> I'm reporting. <laughs> I'm reporting in a very straightforward way. Now, okay, all our listeners know this already, but Republicans fucking hate the estate tax because why? Because one, it's a tax. So they hate it. (laughs) And because, two, it inconveniences very, very, very rich people, which, as far as I can tell, causes most Republican lawmakers, like, insane molecular level rage. (laughs) (laughs) If rich people are getting inconvenienced, that's something that Republicans need to get on top of stat. And so that's why they talk about it all the time. That's why you've heard about it in the news. That's why Trump is up there making a big deal of it and why it's one of these things that continually circles back around in public discourse. So the important thing to know about the history of this debate is that in the 1990s, Republicans made a very concerted effort to rebrand the estate tax as the death tax. You probably know this already, but there's a story uh, out there that as early as 1996, a guy named Jack Ferris, who was uh, head of the National Federation of Independent Business, told everybody in his office that they had to (laughs) use the term death tax rather than estate tax. And if he caught anybody slipping, he'd force them to kick a dollar into the office pizza fund. So like Republicans were coming together during that time and saying, we need to talk about the estate tax in terms of it being a death tax. And it turned out to be an, a very, very successful PR move. Yeah. They reframed the conversation and planted this seed in people's minds to the point where it's swayed uh, public opinion in a pretty dramatic way. Several studies have, have confirmed these particular results over time, but one 2017 poll found that while 66% of people opposed the estate tax, 78% opposed the death tax. (laughs) (laughs) So there you have it. (laughs) But all of this brings me to my next point, which is regardless of this kind of confusion, the estate tax is unpopular. Over many years, poll after poll has shown that the majority of Americans oppose the estate tax. Wow. So, okay, Chad, so in a world crazy. of skyrocketing inequality, why do you think it is that people would oppose a tax that that taxes excess millions of the 0.1%? I don't know. I mean, like, I, I guess my only, the only answer that comes to mind for me is that people are easily duped. Okay. 
So maybe people don't know what the fuck is going on. <laughs> they don't understand the law. They're e easily duped. Surely many people don't really understand what's actually happening. Okay. Let's grant that. Well, let's, uh, let's also imagine that at least some people do understand that the estate tax is the death tax, that it's only taxing a few people and that they still wind up being against it. Like, how can we understand that mentality? I mean, I, I find it an interesting question because it's so mm. bewildering to me. That's I. OK, I. Well, uh, yeah, now that you put it that way, maybe I do have a thought, which is it's this kind of libertarian impulse, right? Like that, that living in the world is a war of all against all. And uh, what we are doing is is competing for the biggest slice mm -hmm. of the pie. Um, and why would you penalize someone uh, for winning? Yeah, right? it's like everything is a game where we're competing against everybody else. And I won the game. Uh, so now you're going to penalize me because I won. Right. And I think that if you put it that way, it sort of like doesn't make intuitive sense to people. I think it, it, you have to jump through a lot of hoops of reasoning to uh, uh, to uh, demonstrate to people why it's not good to concentrate uh, the wealth uh, of a state in an ever shrinking number of uh, people. I, th I think you're on to something with that. And I, I'm going to offer another opinion that I, I think complements the argument that you just made. This is from a, an economist named Stephen Sheffrin who wrote a book called Tax Fairness and Folk Justice, which I didn't read, but I, re I read about. <laughs> and in the show notes, we'll link to an article that discusses it. But in the book, he offers an explanation to precisely this question. In the book, he argues that, among other things, the estate tax offends people's sense of morality and justice. And the specific reasons he offers are, are, are one, because it's uh, people associate the estate tax with death because of the Republican PR machine. And that's offensive to people in some like fundamental way. And two, because people resent the idea of a double tax. And, and this is how many people perceive the estate tax. Like you pay taxes your whole life and then you have to pay taxes again. I've already paid income tax or whatever. Of course, none of these people have paid. Well, I mean, I mean like that's that's the there's complicating a, yeah, factor. There's a few com is. complicating factors. I mean, for reasons that have partially to do with capital gains that I won't get sidetracked on here, it's it's not really an accurate perception at all. But it's there's some truth to it, and it is is certainly the way a, a lot of people perceive this issue. So, the takeaway, in other words. Uh, and this uh, Sheffern's takeaway, which I think is a sort of parallel takeaway from the one that you offered a moment ago, is that there's a, a widespread perception that the estate tax is unjust. And so I'm here, as usual, to just sort of project my quavering disbelief out there into the abyss. I mean, I, I, I'm just sort of wondering <laughs> how the fuck... Is this the narrative winning the hearts and minds of the American citizenry? One one article I re read for today was uh, written yeah. uh, by a guy named Derek Thompson for The Atlantic. We'll link to that article as well. But in it, he makes the point that the estate tax is less about raising money. I mean, it raises $20 billion a year approximately, which is... Uh, you know, it, it's, it's, not I mean, much, it's, a, it's, right? a, it's a bunch of money, but it's significant, but not exactly a game changer in terms of the overall federal budget. It's more about the fact that it's a quote, national statement of values. In other words, this is a nation yeah. that in theory should reject at some level, the rule of oligarchs and plutocrats. And, Absolutely. and to me, yeah. that makes a lot of sense, but in general, it doesn't make a lot of sense to a lot of Americans. Like a lot of Americans just don't believe, believe that somehow a significant segment of the population, if not the majority of the population is actually convinced that it's a good idea for a handful of families to own everything in perpetuity. And like, I mean, how yeah. did the power elite succeed in pulling off this fucking outrageous hegemonic shenanigan? <laughs> you know, <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. Well, 
Yeah. I mean, I've been thinking a lot about this idea lately. I mean, I don't want to get too black pilled, but like, I think, I think that I'm starting to come to the conclusion that authoritarian personalities are not created by charismatic authoritarian leaders, but rather they're always, they always exist as a latent potentiality in any social group and they can be activated by an authoritarian leader. You know, like there's a lot of people who are like, oh, Hitler was such a gifted orator or something, right? Like that, that, uh, that somehow he had this magical charismatic quality that, that changed how people were in some way and made them do things that they wouldn't otherwise do. Uh, I don't think that's the case, right? Like, I don't think that, I don't think that you need a particularly, all you need is, uh, and, and I know this, you know, like this term comes from American politics and it's kind of used by annoying people, but all you need is a permission structure, right? Like all you need is, is for someone to give you the go ahead if you have the authoritarian personality and then you're all in, right? Like then you're, you know, uh, you know, spitting on people of color at a Trump rally. I mean, that's all interesting to me, but it doesn't, it, it doesn't. It doesn't answer the question for me of like why people who don't have very much are looking at people who have everything and believing that it's an okay situation. You know, it just seems like that runs counter oh, to uh, yeah. certainly my experience as a human being. <laughs> you know, like every- no, that's, that's interesting. I mean, maybe that's not the axis that they identify it with one another on. I mean, that, that's something I think that's important to like notice about uh, the hardcore MAGA right is that it transcends economic class. It's not all poor people yeah. or all rich people. Uh, that there are plenty of rich people, plenty of middle class people, lots of small business owners, uh, lots of landlords, uh, lots of working class people. It doesn't correspond to some Racial, gender, or class set. No, it's a it's a motley crew. It's a yeah, it's a motley crew. <laughs> the thing that they have in common is that they like violence and uh, uh, want to, a strong leader to be violent against the people that 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 leader tells them are their enemies and the source of their problems. I guess what I'm saying is. When Trump got elected, we had all of these things. Oh, it's economic insecurity. It's racism. It's whatever. Like, and yeah, like those those things are compounding factors. But I think that there's also an attraction at the level of violence, right? Like just just at the level of this is the way that I see the world. This is the this is the way that I think that the world works. It's a violent struggle, which is the scariest part of it all. Because I mean, you start to you start to internalize that, and then you start to just realize that. Blah, blah, blah. Violence begets violence. And it just seems like this is going one direction. But that's dark. And we don't need to do that here now. What we do need to do is rape the Duncan family, <laughs> which is <laughs> which is almost impossible. You know what? Well, I don't before we wrap up, like um, I just wanted to ask, like of the four of them that inherited the money, um, how many of them voluntarily chose to pay the estate tax because they thought it was the right thing to do? I mean, I'm sure none. <laughs> Otherwise, that would have been in their Wikipedia entry. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's, yeah, very, very peculiar. So that's going to up my rating a little bit. You uh, know, we're we're just going to have to kind of take a shot in the dark here, based on a loose set of coordinates. We're rating them sort of in the aggregate. Where did the money come from? What did they do with the money? I'm going to say, I'm going to say five, just because I don't have a better handle on I, I was going to say six, uh, but I can go five. If I knew more, I'm sure that my rating would change. But given my ignorance... All right. Five's good. Okay. Five's good. All right, so we're at the end of another episode, and as we always do, we are going to randomly pick the billionaires that we will be researching for our next episode, episode 26, coming soon. So Chad is the man with the random billionaire selector. Are you ready to spin it and see who we got? I am.
Robert Rowling, Hotels and Investments. Robert Rowling? Like J.K. Rowling? Uh, exactly like J.K. Rowling. Okay. Uh, he, uh, Oil Fields, Omni Hotels. Never heard of Omni Hotels. Ooh, he owns Gold's Gym. That's kind of interesting. Oh, okay. That's a weird, that's a weird angle. All right. Yeah. Okay. Uh, All Rowling. Right. Okay, let's do the next guy. Let's spin it again. B. Wayne Hughes. B. Self storage. He's a billionaire from self storage. <laughs> oh, that one sounds uh, good. He co founded a self storage company called Public Storage. Okay. Which is very weird because. If it's self storage, it's very clear. Self storage, storage sounds like an interesting thing. But but, but who do you want to talk about? There's, oh no! What? In 2011, he formed American Homes for Rent, and the four is uh, the number four, a publicly traded REIT that owns and rents uh, out 53,000 single family homes. Another another REIT man. Yeah, uh, this guy, he might be like the world's biggest slumlord. Uh, we'll see about that. Um, he sounds awful. So who do you want? I feel like I chose the last time. So you can you can you can have your pick. Well, you seemed uh, you seemed intrigued by the first one. I'll take B Wayne. You're going to take B Wayne. I think there's something interesting <laughs> about the storage. So so let me know what you come up with. Yeah, we can talk about storage a little bit. That'll be good. All right, everybody. Well, thank you if you're still here for for hanging on to the end, and we appreciate you listening as always. What what do we ask them to do? Like, subscribe. I mean, nobody's, we're, we're not, eh, it's fine. Yeah. Do all your, do all of the, any any way you can interact with the digital objects, uh, please do that for us. But more than that, just take care of yourself. Just be safe. Wear a mask. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Thanks for sticking okay, around. Okay, see you next, see you next month. Bye.